السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين ما بعد. We want to pick up where we left off last class and continue to move forward on page 62, the second sajda. This is where this presentation concludes. So we were dealing with the affair of the sajda in general, but we concluded upon the second prostration. As we know, the sujood, the prostration, all of the prostrations, they are from the arkan, they are from the pillars of the prayer, which means that they are a compulsory, obligatory component of the prayer. It cannot be left intentionally. If it is left unintentionally, by accident, it has to be replaced. This presentation details the method of the prostration in conjunction with the takbir. The takbir being the statement, Allahu Akbar. So now we have two actions of the prayer that are going to coexist with one another and they're going to vary from one another. So we want to understand how do they coexist and when they differ, when and how do they differ. So the prostration is the amal, it's the actual action. The prostration is the actual action. It's the motion that takes place, going down and coming up. The takbir, Allahu Akbar, is the statement. So now we have two components of the prayer. One, a physical motion, and one, a verbal statement. The first prostration that takes place, takes place from a standing position. And this is because after the individual has performed rukur, and they raise up, the next obligation in front of them, the next venue, is the actual prostration itself. It is the actual sujood. Going from a standstill position, Sheikh al-Albani, rahimahullah ta'ala, he mentions that there are two descriptions of how the individual is going to perform this prostration. And for each prostration that is going to be made, whether you are going down, whether that going down is from standing or from sitting, or whether you are going to raise up from a sitting position, for every motion that the person that is praying is going to make for the prostration, there are two descriptions of how it can be done. There are two descriptions for how it can be done. So the first approach for the prostration is from a standing position. The individual, as you see here, Sheikh al Albani has mentioned upon the explanation from Sheikh Muhammad Bazmul, Hafizahullah Ta'ala, First, the individual can pronounce the takbir, the statement, 
Allahu Akbar. Then descend. Then the motion follows. So you have a protib. You have a succession. Meaning there is an arrangement. One and then it's followed by the other. The second format or description, you would pronounce the takbir while or when you are descending. Come together. They are joined together. So the actual motional movement and the actual statement are done together. This is from a standing position. That is the first motion for the prostration. Now the individual is in the prostration itself, and he or she is ready to raise and to sit back. Now we have raising from the first position. Again, the two descriptions, the first, the individual can pronounce the takbir and then raise up. So the actual statement is going to take place while you are down. In prostration, Allahu Akbar, and then raise up. The second description, the individual is going to state the takbir while he or she is raising up. So if you notice now, there's a similarity. There's a pattern. Between these two descriptions, going for prostration from standing and raising from prostration from the prostration itself, the second itemization, takbir, while or when descending. Takbir, while, or when, raising. Meaning that the statement goes hand in hand with the motion. Whether you're going down or whether you're going up. If this looks like it may be too technical, it's too detailed, and you say, I just want to water it down. I just want something simplified that I can take with me. I can pull off the page. It's going to be easy to digest, and I can do this for the duration of my prayer. We will say go with option number two. Meaning you do both of them at the same time. So now you don't have to keep in mind any type of distinction. Well, when was I supposed to say the tech beer? Before I moved or after the tech beer? Or after the, the, the actual motion? In this situation, we would say do both together. If you're not sure, do both together. From a standing position, you're ready for prostration. We would say make motion and movement and make statement together. Allahu Akbar. When the individual is in prostration, he says, I'm, I'm not sure now. Am I supposed to raise up first or do I say the statement? Do both together. Allahu Akbar. And sit back. That's your first prostration. As we mentioned, the prostration is a pillar of the prayer. And it is the only pillar that takes place twice. The standing takes place once at this junction that is required. The recitation of Surah Al-Fatiha takes place once at its junction, where it is required. The actual bowing, ruqur, takes place once at its actual junction, where it is required. Raising from ruqur only takes place once. However, the prostration is the only pillar of the prayer amongst the various pillars that takes place twice. It is the only pillar that takes place twice. Like we mentioned, the statement, the tasmir, semi Allah, man hamid. It only takes place once during the prayer. And the tahmid, Rabbana lak al hamd. It only takes place once during the prayer, meaning in a unit of the prayer. But the prostration takes place twice in one unit of the prayer. So now we've gone from the standing position. We've gone down, we've gone down to prostration and we've raised up from prostration and we're in a sitting position. Now we have one more prostration ahead of us. This is where it's written in purple, if you would say. Is this color purple or is this that T-Mobile color? What is that? What's the name of that color? Does anybody know? Fuchsia. Magenta. Magenta. So it's more like magenta, a soft, watered-down magenta, if you would say. The second prostration, just for individuals that want to be able to make the distinction. That's why we changed the color. So now, and maybe to help you memorize it too. So I remember it was in purple or magenta. So now for the second prostration, you're in a sitting position now, 
and you need to go down into prostrate. It says, beer can be made first, and then you prostrate. Is there anyone that needs a book? No? Go ahead. You make the takbir first, the statement, Allahu Akbar, from a sitting position. Then you prostrate. Or you can make the takbir with the prostration. So you again, now you see that that pattern, that similarity, it is now starting to increase. Make the takbir with the motion, regardless of the direction. Make the takbir with the motion, regardless of its direction. Make the takbir with the motion, regardless of its di direction. And because from this position now, you're going for prostration. So again, if it looks too technical, if you say, just water it down, give me a basic version of something that I can take with me, and it's going to be easy for me to remember and to incorporate. I'm not going to have to recall when or how or details. We would say, do everything together for the prostration. Prostrate and say the statement at the same time from a standing position. Once you're in prostration, raise up and say the statement together at the same time. For the second prostration for going down, say the statement while you're going down. At this particular junction, now the second description the individual makes the takbir, then raises up. The individual makes the takbir, then they raise up. As opposed to the individual raising first, then pronouncing the takbir. So you have that common theme of motion and movement with statement from beginning to end of the prostration. However, with the last one, you will see that it's very inscription. The individual is in prostration and will say the statement and then raise up. Us through the actual prostration itself, distance with the takbir. We do know it's placed upon seven bones. Those seven bones, the forehead and toes being counted as one, the two hands. Two, three, the two knees, four, five, and the two feet, six and seven. We've mentioned from Sheikh Uthameen, Rahimullah Ta'ala, that an individual prostrating can be prostrating upon three different partitions or three different barriers between him and her and the earth. What do we mean by this? The asl, the basic foundation of an individual that is going to pray, they're going to pray upon the ground. They are not going to burden themselves with trying to find a prayer rug, a cushion landing for them to pray upon. That is not the basis. If it is a specific condition of an individual, then they cater to it. But that would not be the, the situation that you would enjoin upon everyone else that you are praying with or that you are teaching. We would teach them, pray on the floor. The Prophet, Ali wasalam, he mentioned, Ju'ilat li al-ard masjidan wa tukhuran. The Prophet, Ali wasalam, he mentioned, and this narration is within this work, that the earth has been made for me, masjidan, a place of prayer, wa tukhuran, and a purifier. Not just pure, but a purifier. It is pure within itself, and it is a purifier, meaning that you can use it for tayammum. This is one of the virtues, the miza, that have been given to the Prophet, as he mentioned that the previous nations, they would have to play, they would have to pray in their places or houses of worship. This is an ease and an allowance that has been given to us. If you look at the distinction and the previous omas, you will see that the common theme is ease and convenience that has been given to this omma that was not granted to previous nations. So what is the eye-opener from that? 
that it really shows you not only the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but what is desired for the Ab to be able to facilitate that worship itself, where there are no extraneous hardships and difficulties placed upon you. Whereas with the previous nation, if something of impurity befell them, they would have to discard that garment. There is no purification through water like there is for us. When it is time to pray, and we know that from the narration when the Prophet ﷺ made the night journey and ascension that Musa ﷺ had mentioned in comparison to what the Prophet ﷺ was enjoined with, that his people were enjoined with more than five prayers as is enjoined upon us. So not only was the difficulty or the hardship in the dealing with impurities, but the place of where the individual had to pray, more restrictive and more numerous, which increases the percentages of an individual running up against the hardship, if you would say. But we see with this ummah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has facilitated ease upon ease upon ease. And this is why it is very unbecoming of any servant, male or female, regardless of your status or stature inside of the religion, meaning that you're new or you've been here for some time, that you are not steadfast upon your worship. What do we mean that you're not steadfast upon your worship? That you are not compliant with the injunctions that are asked of you. Five prayers. Purification for the prayer. Zakat, if you qualify from the avenues of that which may render you obligated to pay. Fasting the month of Ramadan, one month out of 12 months. For, if you would say, a portion of the day. It's not 24 hours for 29 or 30 days. The pilgrimage to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, man istata'a ilayhi sabilan. For the one that is capable of doing so. And even in the performance of the Hajj, for those that have went, they know. For those that haven't, they could research or ask those that have went. It is not a blood drawing activity where the individual feels like it took almost all of the life out of me. It is not that type of activity. Yes, there is struggle. There is transitioning from place to place. It's complicated by the izdiham, the crowdedness of the people. But the actual activities of worship are light and easy. So one of the things that we want to keep in mind when we find ourselves struggling with the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon those things that at base we need to be in compliance with. We need to be praying five times a day. We need to be fasting the month of Ramadan. We need to be paying our zakat if we qualify. And we need to be performing the hajj if we qualify as well. That at least understand the ease that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has facilitated inside of the legislation for your benefit to draw close to him. It's not for the benefit of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And at the same time, it is not extraneous and hard and difficult for an individual to stand, to bow, and to prostrate. Whether it's for two units, three units, or four units. At a particular time of the day with the leniency in the time frames, regardless of the season. And then we even see that when an individual is traveling, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in terms of the fast, at that time, removed from you. For the individual that is praying, you have the allowance to not only shorten the units of the prayer, but combine and put both of them together. For whose benefit? For your benefit and for my benefit. Not for the benefit of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It does not make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala any more loftier that you've shortened and combined. It facilitates your worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for your benefit. So when we see that the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam, he mentions, Ju'ilat liya al-ard, masjidan wa tuhuran, 
Wherever the Muslim is, he has his place of prayer and his item of purification. What excuse do you walk around and say that you have? That the individual is not going to pray except you don't want to pray. You don't want to bow for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And everything bows. Compliance voluntarily being complied. Meaning that being put upon you that you will bow for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So for you and I, this is just a dhikr. It's not the thick of the salah per se, but this is a reminder upon the mudur, upon the topic of the prayer itself, and for other aspects of that which at basis Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has obligated upon you. The Prophet ﷺ, he sent Mu'adh ibn Jabal to Yemen, informed them about the tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They accept that, inform them about the salawat. If they accept that, inform them about the zakat. You see this aspect of the ease of Islam. Tell them about this. If they accept that, move on to the next junction. The desert Arab comes to the Messenger of Allah, والسلام, and he's asking about Islam, and he tells them about the five prayers. Is there anything upon me other than that? He said, no, unless you choose to indulge upon your own self. From the ease, the convenience of the religion, that anywhere we are, we can pray. We have the precursor for it, the purification right there under your feet, wherever you may be. So how does the servant return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say, with the expansiveness of your earth and the purity of your earth, they pray. And this was the first thing that you're going to be questioned about. If you have this cognizance, you have this consciousness, you have this awareness, this is something that should always be scratching your back. Pray. Did you pray? Your day should be structured around your five salawat to a point where it, has, it becomes almost the back of your hand. We know we're going to do this, then we know we're going to do that, and we know we're going to do this then. Why? Because prayer. The prayer takes priority. Out of the affairs of the deen, the prayer is at the head of the actions. And then the affairs of your dunya, they follow the affairs of the deen. So we prioritize. Like when the Messenger of Allah, وسلم, he sent Mu'adh, tell them about the tawheed. If they accept it, tell them about the salat. If they accept it, tell them about the zakat. There's no way we're going to itemize or prioritize anything from amongst the affairs of the dunya over the affairs of the deen. Especially those that we know that with inside of the affairs of the deen, they're at the head. How could anything now from the dunya trump this? So coming full circle now, we have the affair of the actual motion and movement of the prostration with the affair of the tech beer. As we've mentioned, it is upon the seven limbs. Sheikh Uthameen, Rahimullah Ta'ala, mentioned that there are three categories of when an individual is prostrating that could come between him and the ground that he's praying upon. The first could be that of a prayer rug or a prayer mat, as we see here, Sheikh Al-Abani, he has titled the chapter concerning the affair of the prayer upon the prayer rug or the prayer mat or the likeness of such. And this is on page 59. Such the on the ground on mats. Such the on the on mats. The first of the three would be where an individual would be prostrating on something that is independent of him or her, meaning it is the actual mat. It's not connected to you, and it's not you. So the individual is now praying upon something that is independent of him or her. It's an independent item or article. It's a prayer mat, it's a prayer rug, or as we see in these days of COVID, we have these little 
maybe three by three paper, uh, paper mats, if you would say, paper partitions. And I'm really dumbfounded, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, upon what is the fa'ida. What is the fa'ida of the paper three by three mat? Is anybody aware of what is the fa'ida of this mat? Or, or, or what is attributed to it? Not that it has to be what you ascribe to it or what you're utilizing it for. You may just be following the people. We're not dealing with that. We're just talking about what is the actual fa'ida of the three by three paper mat. It's like a, a paper sheet that the people put down. Is it to stop the spread of the COVID? How does it stop the spread? Huh? So as it being a partition between you and the floor, is it to protect you from the actual floor? It's possible, but then what would happen if the case was the individual that prayed to your left or to your right, neither has the mass, and they are closer to you at that particular junction for more of the prayer than you are prostrating inside of the prayer upon the three by three paper mat? Okay, so let me ask you, because when you're dealing with some issues like this, you're weighing out the thick of risk reward. Is it possible or have the studies been done that if you have the virus or that the virus is minimized by utilizing this type of partition that it doesn't adhere or that it does adhere to the partition? Because when you get up and you pick it up, you still have it and you're dragging it through the master or you're transitioning it from one place to the next now. So now the issue is scientifically database. Is it known that this will actually minimize the transmission? Because now from what it seems to be is that the concern with surface contact isn't as presumed to be when it first arrived and came to us. The airborne transmission, as well as surface con contact and transmission, were almost parallel to one another. And it seems to be, from what they mentioned, in terms of what is data, scientific-based, that the transmission from surface contact is very minimal and not as presumed initially. So. Where does it match up with the usage of these, these mats? And I'm not saying don't use it. And I'm not saying that it's incorrect. But what we're saying is, is it, is it producing the benefits that at the same time are not being outweighed by other avenues? Just like when an individual is commanding the good, it doesn't mean that there are no avenues of harm inside of it. They have, to, they have to realize that there are some avenues of harm that come along with commanding the good. It's just that the good is overwhelming and it precedes the harm. So we do it, but it does not negate the presence of harm. The likeness for the opposite. Because you are negating something of harm, it does not mean that everything that is entailed or incorporated or that is inclusive of it is harm, that there's no goodness inside of it. There will be goodness at times. But the overwhelming count is that it is a problem. It is a, that which is that should be abstained from. We're going to leave it off. But the person who said about this particular benefit is outweighed at this time. So even though it's known that we weigh out good and bad, it should be known that inside of the good at times, there are some articles 
that are harms. And inside of the harm, there are some articles of goodness at the same time. It's not just all harm 100% or goodness 100%. But like I said, me and myself, I'm particularly dumbfounded by it in terms of what is the overwhelming benefit for the individual to take a ha'il based off of the fiqh of the asl we pray on the floor. Now when you take the ha'il, it has to be something that puts you at a position of this is of greater benefit than not to utilize. Other than that, it's of no usage. The risk reward factor. So the first aspect is that the individual is praying upon something that is independent of him or her. As we mentioned, this fell in the conversation. The second category, the individual is praying upon something that is connected to him or her. Meaning that you might be praying and the floor is too hot, so now I'm going to take my, uh, my sleeve of my thobe, I'm going to use it for my forehead and for my nose because the floor is just too hot. Or I may use a torf. I may use uh, an end portion, a coattail, if you were saying, of my thobe. Or well, sister, she may use a portion of her khimar and just put it down and to uh, partition herself from the floor. It's extremely hot. It's extremely cold. But now you're prostrating upon a ha'il. It's an actual partition. But at this stage, it's connected to you. With the need that is used for now, we would say utilize it because this, is, was, this was the condition of the companions. Thirdly, and this is where this topic really surfaces, where the individual may prostrate upon a limb of him or her, meaning there may be a hand over a hand. So there actually are not seven limbs that are down now. It might be a foot over a foot, which more than likely would take place probably with a child, somebody that is adolescent that doesn't really understand the particulars and the importance of the prostration. And they may just be playing around. Or we could raise the level of the conversation and say that the individual now itching his foot. His Achilles is itching. The hands are too far. The nearest and the most simplest thing for the individual to do is just to use the back of his, his toes and now scratch his Achilles. But now the conversation could take a, a, a turn. How long <clears throat> are you in this condition compared to what is supposed to be considered your prostration. You've gone down, you're not firm, you raise up, you scratch, now you sit back. This is not a complete prostration because the seven bones are not down firmly and you do not have tomatnina, you do not have ease and relaxation. It's very important to remember that as Sheikh Al-Adbani is mentioning at various junctions of this work, although it is inclusive at other junctions, the affair of rest and relaxation, so that when you are in rukur, you have ease and relaxation in your rukur. When you raise up, you have ease and relaxation in your standing before you prostrate. When you go for prostration, while in prostration, upon seven limbs, you have ease and relaxation. And uh, understanding of what ties into, well, how do I know I'm at quote-unquote relaxation? By narration, it mentions that until every bone has taken its place of settlement. So we know the natural status of a person's bone structure differs from standing to bowing to prostration. So what do we understand is the place of rest for those bones? As by description of each junction of the prayer, when the individual is bowing for rukur, with the hands on the knees, Firmly placed, the fingers are spread, the elbows are to the side, the back is leveled, the head is leveled with the back. All of this is to help bring about tumatnina, ease and relaxation. These descriptions and formats of the prayer actually tie into that ease and relaxation, allowing you to acquire it. Without it, it's very hard for an individual to be at ease and relaxation if within the rukur, you don't have your hands on your knees. And the person would say, well, how could you pray without your hands on your knees? This is something that has been given a quote-unquote green light by some of the scholars. The likeness of Sheikh Fozan. The likeness of Sheikh Fozan. Your record will be sound without your hands on your knees, according to his explanation of Bologna Maru. And other, uh, Sheikh Abdullah al-Bassam as well. 
Your rukur would be sound without your hands on your knees. But would you be at ease and would you be relaxed? It's easier to acquire and accomplish with hands, elbows extended, fingers spread upon the knees, firmly placed, grounded, so that the individual can now become settled and eased and relaxed. The same thing for the prostration. If the individual is at a junction of the prostration and they are not at ease, that prostration is not sound. It's not counted. If the individual is in the prostration and they are not able to perform with some of the people in knowledge, the desired supplication and, and prostration, subhana rabbi al-a'la. The individual said, I went down and I relaxed, but I didn't give myself enough time. The prostration is not sound. So it is very important that you understand with this third category that even yourself could hinder your own prostration if you're not aware that your seven limbs are not down. Even so much so that Shaykh Uthaneen, Rahim Ta'ala, he mentioned, he said, I am in doubt concerning the soundness of the individual that is in prostration. His or her hand is down but the thumb is curled. The thumb is curled, meaning that the thumb is not firmly down because by we, we know by description, the thumb of the individual should be facing the same direction as the rest of the fingers, together facing the direction of the Qibla. But for the individual that has the hand down and the thumb is curled, so now that the thumb is not down like the rest of the hand, like the rest of the body limb should be, like it was the face of the individual, the forehead without the nose. Sheikh Uthameen said, even in this situation, he said, I'm not sure of the soundness of this individual's prostration. This all feeds into the understanding of, when it comes to these three categories, understanding how it ties into the soundness of the prostration itself. So... We have the movements with the motions, with the statements, with the bodily limbs, with the descriptions of the prostration itself. One thing that is very important, I want to ask of you. Sheikh Al-Albani, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, he has the also, he has the original work, which is this work. Then there is the translated work that all of us have. And then there is a talkhis, summarization of this work. Not this work, it's a summarization of this work, the translated work. And they translated it into English as well, if I'm not mistaken. But there is, of course, there is the text in Arabic. So in the summarization, Sheikh al Albani, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, he itemizes, we have here, 25 components, 25 descriptive elements dealing with prostration. We don't have 25 people here. We may have about half. So that would, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, allow us to go around twice. If you don't know, Allahu A'lam. If you don't know, Allahu A'lam. Let me say, Allahu A'lam, we pass. But there are just various descriptions. So we're looking for something as simple as we've mentioned, as I've already given fingers together facing the direction of the Qibla. That's a descriptive quality that Sheikh al Bani enumerates because he presented it within his work. So the summarization, he said the prostration should entail this, 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 and he got up to 25. So these are basic details. If you have your notes in front of you, you can utilize your notes. Memorization with the people of Hadith, the, from the science of Hadith. Memorization is from two angles. Hifd al-Sadr. Memorization from the chest, meaning as we refer to it, I know it by heart. I know my ABCs by heart. I don't have to look at the text to recount them. Or... Hifdul Kitab, 
Your memorization is from what you have written and scribed. So if you have your notes in front of you, refer back to your notes. Now, this is the aid, and it will show you if there's anything that needs to be added on or if you have followed the course. So we'll start right, left. Do you want to go with my right or do you want to go with your right? It really doesn't matter to me. Lakum khiyar, as they say. You have the option, you have the choice. So we'll start with, well, Abdul Aziz is older. Ah, oh, subhanAllah. I put my mouth by saying that. I don't know who's older. I'm assuming. No, but you're the right. If we did like this, you're, you're the right. So, pardon me, Sheikh. Well, every, every, I'm 50, this, except for the young sister. I'm 50 this year, the end of this year, and I'm probably the baby in this class. So we're all elders here. So it's just uh, in, in jest. No, I said I'm 50. I'm the baby. I think more than like more than often, I am the youngest person in the class. More than often, I am the youngest person in the class. Except when Elijah comes or the likeness of somebody like Elijah. So I have respect for my elders. This is plain jest. So Abdulaziz, give me one description of that which takes place from an individual that is going down to Sajda, and there is a host of what's written on the board for those that don't have notes or that are new to the class, to the point where the individual has finished the second prostration. Go from the standing position where you're going to go for prostration, because there are descriptions for it, to the point where you have finished your second prostration, because after the second prostration, now the next element or venue in front of you is another pillar. The pillars, they continuously change, like combination on a lock. But you need all of them for the combination. But not one is more important than the other, but the one that's most important is the one that you need next. So these pillars are like that inside of the prayer. So just give me one description, inshallah ta'ala. To look at the pre, to look at the place of prostration. So you will go this way with the brothers, and then we'll go that way with the sisters. Sheikh Mustafa. Anything, anything. A descriptive quality connected to prostration. Connected to prostration. Any descriptive quality, I would say, oh, that, that, that concerns the prostration. That's not qiyam, that's not ruqur, that's not julus or tashahud or whatever. That's sujood. That, oh, that issue, we deal with that when we talk about sujood. Give me anything from that which is concerning the bab of sujood. Don't make it hard on yourself, Sheikh. Who are your seer? Walakin, as the companion came to the Prophet, he asked him about an affair of the deen. He said, Laqad sa'alta an azim. He said, Indeed, you've asked about an extraordinary, tremendous affair. But indeed, it is only easy for the one that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it easy for. So just give me any detail, any nook and cranny concerning to sujood. Like a khiyar, you have a choice. You could pick in the dark. Okay, I, what I'll do, I'll true or false you. While in sujood, the individual is allowed to recite the Quran based off of the work of Sheikh al-Albani. Solely based off of the work of Sheikh al-Albani, not the aqwal al-ulama, not the statements of the ulama that we have presented. Based off of the work of al-Albani, the recitation of the Quran in sujood is permitted. Sah, this is correct. Based off of the work of Sheikh al-Albani, it is prohibited for you to recite Quran in sujood. 
طيب حبيب لا لا يو ونت تشوف اوس تشوف اوس از مور ريستريكتيف مينينغ ذات يو هاف تو هاف ا افورتين انفورميشن از اوبوز تو ذس You could go any which way you want, left or right. But true or false, you have to have it in your tool chest to say yes or no. <laughs> Does he do this with you too? <laughs> okay, tell you. When the individual is in subdued, The toes, this is true or false. The toes of the individual that are in sujood, as he is facing forward, the toes should be facing backwards, away from the Qibla. So his body is facing the Qibla, his fingers are facing the Qibla, but his toes are pointed back, away from the Qibla. So fingers forward, toes backwards, away from the Qibla. True or false? This is correct. They should be facing the direction of the Qibla. They should be pointed forward. Tayyib, Basha, any element of sujood. When you say the face, the forehead and the nose. The forehead and the nose. Tayyib, Yahya. He mentioned that the forehead and the nose of the individual should be down in the prostration. Should be down firmly in the prostration. Sheikh Yahya. Heels together. Good. From the sisters. Can you give me another description of the heels? Because he mentioned the toes should be, should be pointed forward, not pointed back. Sheikh Yahya mentioned the heels are to be together. Give me another description even though it might seem like common sense, it is by direction that we're looking for. Now, you know? He mentioned that already. He mentioned that the heels, she's gonna get you, man, you're in trouble. The heels should be together. There's another quality of the heels. Huh? Together is one. Can the sisters give it? Huh? The heels turned in prostration? Left. Huh? I, I hear it over here. I hear it over here. If you go to page 53, If you go to page 53 and you go to the first, second, third, fourth, fifth paragraph. So first, second, third, fourth, fifth paragraph. He used to put his knees and toes down firmly. Point with the front of the toes towards the Qibla. That was Habib. Put his heels together. That was Yahya. This is what we wanted from the sisters. Keep his feet upright and ordered likewise. See these qualities. It's almost like it's common sense. But we want it by narration. Is it what? Yes, but we wanted that they're going to be mansub, mansubatani. They're going to be arched, upright. Arched, upright. Right? So... Welcome back, sister. Give us one of the descriptive qualities of sujood. Something that you know concerns the prostration. It is a position that some of the people of knowledge have mentioned, but we want to go from something that Sheikh al Bani has mentioned here within the work. We did mention there was some statements of the people of knowledge concerning that. However, we didn't favor it. We didn't favor it. But there is something that is concerning this very aspect or portion of the body 
But what is this description in general without specifying the women? What is it? From the work of Sheikh Al Albani. From the work, let's go back to page 53. Huh? They should be spread. They should be spread. This is from the work of Sheikh Al Albani. They should be spread. Let me see if I can find you something real quick. They say 54. Mashallah. He used to order likewise, saying, when you perform sajda, place your palms on the ground and raise your elbows. And raise your elbows. If you look and continue, and be level in sujood. And be level in sujood. Sheikh Al-Albani commented on that particular narration, that particular portion of the narration, and mentioned that, that the maqsood is to ma'nina, to be at ease to be at ease and relaxation in the prostration. That was intended by the wording of that particular narration. To be level, meaning to be at ease and relaxed. So, when another, oh, you said stop saying, Aida, another description of the prostration. Anything. If you need to, you can go to the board. Or do you want true and false? The back being spread evenly. This is rukur. This is bowing. This is rukur. Give us something from prostration. Any descriptive quality or element concerning sujood. What about the hands? Hands placed firmly down. Hands placed firmly down. Which direction? Towards the Qibla. So you have any descriptive quality? Naam, the sujood is accompanied by the takbir. It is accompanied by the takbir. There are various... Uh, performances of how it can be um, executed, but there, it is accompanied by the tech beer. So yeah, we move to the other sister. Any descriptive quality concerning the sujood? Say it again. From sujood? We're not there yet. We're not there yet. It is connected, but we're not there yet, inshallah. How about what? You can go from memory, you can go from your notes, or you could go from the board. Or we could go true or false if you if you opt. True or false. Tell you. The Prophet وسلم, inside of his sujood, he would say, Subhana Rabbi al Azim. Inside of his sujood, inside of his prostration, upon his seven bones. He would say, Subhana Rabbi al Azim. True or false? False. This is correct. This is correct. We'll move on. Any descriptive quality? Huh? 
Not really? The forearms are not rested. Very important. Very important. The forearms are not resting on the ground. Inside of this prohibition, there is discussion amongst the people of knowledge that mention that for the individual inside of their worship, at various junctions and various that the individual should not do so-and-so like this of this particular animal. And this is because these animals are not, how do we say it? These animals in these descriptions that they are being referred to in these particular narrations, they are not motions of humility and humbleness, like the pecking, like the sitting of a dog. It's not the sitting of humility and humbleness. Why the hair and the garment should not be tucked back because the people of quote unquote nobility, they would hold their garments back out of it not wanting to touch the ground. This is in contrary to being humble to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whereby Shaykh what they mean mentions you have placed the highest portion of your body towards the lowest portion possible, the most noble portion of your body, your face upon the most despicable place that you could possibly place it, the floor. Out of humbleness and meekness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That these descriptive qualities of these animals, it is not referred to or is not referred to actions of humbleness, actions of meekness. But rather this sitting of the dog is the sitting of laziness which is unbefitting for the individual that is standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that you should within your sitting, because there are some descriptions of iqa'a that are the sitting of the dog. But for you to sit on your heels arched up together, toes facing forward, heels together, and your rear end sitting on it, this is the sunnah. But if you split them, and you lower the shin or you keep it raised and you sit the rear end on the floor with the forearms down, this is like the sitting of the dog. This is a posture of laziness. And this is why if you look at these particular uh, descriptions, don't kneel like the kneeling of a camel. Don't sit like the sitting of a dog. Don't peck like the pecking of a, of a, what, what? Of a, of a hen or a chicken. In terms of the ibadah, that it is telling you to abstain away from this particular format during this particular action, it negates humbleness. It negates humbleness. That sitting of the dog is a sitting of laziness. That's that pecking of the hen or the, the chicken, as we would say, or whatever the situation is, it is not a motion of tran tranquility and ease. They go against the essence and they go against the elements of what the prayer is built upon. So at those various junctions, it says when you do this, don't do it like that. Because this particular junction, this is contrary to it. So this is very important. I actually mentioned this. I wanted to just give you this added benefit from the people of knowledge. They mentioned this. This is not a shun that this animal is a disobedient animal or this, this animal is a shaitan. It's that this action of this particular animal, in terms of the action of ibadah that you are to abstain from it, it negates the essence of what is inside of the role of what is taking place in the prayer at that time. Whether it is of humbleness, whether it is of meekness, whether it is of tranquility, of ease, or relaxation. So let's finish with the sisters. Give us one descriptive quality from the... Affairs of prostration. Uh, 
tumatnina, ease and relaxation. That is definitely something keynote because it is a pillar that's taking place within a pillar. So this is very important. This is very important. And did you give us one? I believe you did give us one, right? Give us another one. Toyib. At this junction, the servant is closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he or she is prostrating. This is one of the junctions of the prayer that you are encouraged to call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to supplicate, to ask, to beg, to beseech Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is one of the junctions that it is encouraged. If you're going to ask, ask here. So, one round, we've taken some time. We're going to continue and move, but there are a host of other elements to make to keep yourself abreast upon. What you can do is as you go through the actual motions of the sujood and just start enumerating them. The takbir at this particular junction. Going down, hands first. If you prefer and you understand it's hands first, then you would check that off. Hands first. If you're a knee first person, you say no, the narration or what I understand from it is not what Alabani sees, it is knees first, then you check that off. It's knees first. Then you have seven bones. Then you have fingers. Then you have elbows. Then you have the knees. Then you have the feet with the toes. Then you have them down firmly, as Sheikh Alabani stresses, that they're not just down lightly, they are down firmly. Then you have the supplication that takes place inside of it. Then you have the ease and relaxation that takes place inside of it. Then you have the lengthening of the sajda itself that takes place. Then at this junction, you have the individual sitting back. In the sitting back, the individual is also incorporating the takbir, however he or she wills or desires. While sitting back, you have the various supplications that can be said. And for those individuals that are just commonly upon, if you say, between the two prostrations, there are those from the people of knowledge, the likeness of Sheikh Mukbil and others, that mention that you are allowed to go to three as well, not just two. So if you were doing two, you're allowed to do three. And the individual now going down for the second prostration, doing in the second prostration as they've done in the first prostration, then the affair of the takbir and sitting back, the ease. While the individual is sitting back, they can sit as long as they were in prostration. When the individual now is sitting back from the second prostration, this is something that we want to address. If we go to the sitting of rest on page 63. The sitting of rest on page 63. Next, he would sit straight on his left foot upright until every bone returned to its position. I personally have some quarrel with this wording. I personally have some quarrel with this wording. When you compare it to the nos of Sheikh Al Albani's work, what you may come away with in the English may be slightly variant from what Sheikh al Albani had in his text. Next, he would sit upright on his left foot, upright until every bone returned to its position. When you look at it and it says, next he would sit upright. Then in the parentheses they have here, on his left foot, upright. It can give you the understanding that the left foot is not planted as a firash. That is resting on the floor until every bone returned to its position. So you would see something in the mist. It may not jump off the page and you just continue with it. But in terms of the actual wording itself, 
to me, it is troublesome. Even if the individual that is familiar with the prayer and says, well, I understand what they're actually trying to say. You should not have to read into it because everyone is not going to read into it the same way. And everybody is not endowed with the same vision to look into it, to decipher which way to go with it. Maybe a person is new to Islam and they see that and they say, next he will sit straight. I'm going to sit straight on his left foot upright. Well, we mentioned that in prostration, the feet are up. At other junctions of the prayer, the right foot is up. So now how is the left foot up? The left foot is not up. The left foot at this junction, it is not up. So this is something for me that is troublesome. This sitting of rest is referred to as jalsatul istiraha. For some of the people in knowledge, jalsatul istiraha. The sitting of rest, the sitting of relaxation. Shaykh Uthaymeen, rahimahullah ta'ala, in his work as Sharh al mumtir he mentions that the people of knowledge have three different positions concerning this rest. What's going to happen with this rest? You're going to raise up from the second prostration. And as you were sitting in between prostrations, and this was another aspect that you could have checked off, but when I raise from prostration, I'm going to sit iqa'a. I'm going to keep my two feet together with my toes facing the direction of the Qibla. I'm not just going to rest my rear end on the heels. You could have checked that box too. That's another description of what takes place concerning prostration. And this is the only time you can sit like this in the prayer. This is the only time you can sit like that in the prayer, between prostrations. You can't sit like this for tashahud. Or the individual is going to sit muftarishan. And what does that mean? Your left foot is going to be sitting under your rear end. Whereas the bottom of your foot is angled up. So you're actually sitting on the bottom of the foot and the top of the foot that you wipe if you're making mess is actually going to be angled down towards the floor. So not 100% but to a degree, your foot is reversed. You stand with the bottom of your foot towards the floor, the top up. When you're sitting muftarishan, which is how you sit between prostrations, your foot reverses now. The bottom of the foot angles up and it meets the rear end. The top of the foot angles down and it meets the floor. So that's, that's the left foot. The right foot, is angled up, meaning that just like when you was in uh, prostration and the heels were up, the right heel is going to remain up and the toes are going to remain facing forward, but it's going to be to your side. It's not going to be under you. So we're, we're going to get there. We're going to get there, inshallah ta'ala. You, you had a, a question, sister? So we're going to get there. Actually, we'll deal with it now. Ibn Abdullah ibn Umar, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he was a hefty man at the time of this incident or scenario. He was a hefty man. He was carrying weight. And he was sitting with his feet crossed underneath him. Not how we normally sit the Indian style, mutarabbi'an. But the individual is now sitting, the knees are down on the floor. And instead of sitting back, muftarishan, you just cross both of your feet under you and you sit back on them. This is how Abdullah ibn Umar was sitting. And another individual saw him, being that he's a companion of the Prophet, والسلام, he mimicked his sitting. And Abdullah ibn Umar, he told him, don't do this. This is not the sunnah of the messenger, والسلام. he said, I see you doing it, so I'm, I, I did it. He said, verily, I did it because my two heels cannot bear the weight in that sitting position. So he sat with his feet crossed for more support. If you, if you notice, maybe in the beginning of the day, 
at morning for Fajr, you're raising from sleep, your body has rested, your bones, not your bones, your muscles have tightened up. When you go to sit, you might need to be a little gingerly because you don't want to stress the knee area. So you know what I'm saying? I'm going to sit, but I'm going to sit back. You might even place your hands on your knees to just comfort yourself. Say, I'm going to go back, but I'm going to take my time because there's no rush. Even with the sunnah and the fajr that are prayed quickly, in this situation, because of condition, it's going to be adjusted. You're going to just sit back and you're going to relax. To sit muftarishan may be difficult, but to sit with your feet crossed may be easier. The Messenger of Allah, Ali Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, mentioned, إِذَا أَمَرْتُكُمْ بِأَمْرٍ فَأْتُوهُ مِنْهُ مَسْتَطَعْتُمْ When I command you with any type of ordinance, do as much of it as you can. So if you're not able to do that, then you try to do as much of that as you can with some adjustment. But what you keep in mind is, don't go to the extent where the adjustment does not resemble the actual article or movement that is desired. So what do we mean by that? The individual says, well, for me to make rukur is a little difficult. So when I'm going to bend, I'm going to bend like this and I'm going to stop. This is good for me. At this junction, Sheikh Wutaymin, Rahim Ta'ala, mentioned because you are closer to standing than rukur. This is not rukur. This is not suitable. So what do we say for him? Have a seat. Bow the head. For sujood, the individual will say, I'm going to go down, but I can't actually get towards the floor. In this situation, you're closer to sitting than you are of prostrating. Have a seat. You take a seat. La yukalifu Allahu nafsan illa wus'aha. Allah does not um, burden a soul beyond that which it is able to bear or carry out. Allah has not placed any hardships or difficulties inside of your deen. So any junction of the prayer, <clears throat> if you're not able to fulfill it, you go with that hadith of Imran ibn Hussein. When he came to the Prophet والسلام, and mentioned his hemorrhoids, he said, Salli qa'iman, pray standing. Then pray sitting. If you're not able to do so, then pray even lying down. So with that in consideration, and if I order you to do something, do as much of it as you can. You do what you can, and what you can't is removed from you. There's a qaida, there's a, there's a principle. Wala wajib ma'al ajaz. There's no obligation when there's incapability. person says, I can't fast. The fast is ob ob obligatory. Person says, I can't fast. I physically cannot fast. I have an illness. I have a sickness. I have a need for medication. La wajib ma'al ajaz. In this situation, there is no obligation upon you. You're not able to. So in any of the fulfillments, a person says, um, I just had a skin burn. The doctor told me this area, this region from elbow to wrist is to stay uncontaminated from anything. He doesn't even want me to wash, let alone wudu. In this type of situation, la wajib ma'al ajaz. There's no obligation for you to use water at this junction for this area, this region, because of it's, you're, un you're incapable. So this is something that you keep in mind. Whenever you're not able to perform something, its obligation has been raised up off of you. To what degree? To the degree of what is the hardship. Now. So you. It may not cooperate. So you. <laughs> I'm I'm talking from experience when I say we sit back for the sunnah and the gingerly because 
We are created weak as infants. Then we gain strength. But then at some junction, and most people will probably tell you at the age of 40, maybe mentally, the peakness is there. The maturity is there. But physically, you're on a decline. So I'm 10 years beyond that. And I'm the youngest. So we can understand that we're on the weaker side of our days than we are on the stronger side of our days. So I'm talking not just from experience, but I'm giving you the statements of the people of knowledge. But I am familiar with some of the ills and some of the conditions that might be present because I either experienced them or I'm around them or I've addressed them previously with other classes pertaining to this particular work. So if there's a situation a person says, that particular sitting, and there's another style of sitting, mutawarrikan, which is more advanced, is, I'm speaking from experience, I rarely do it myself, it's very hard upon the knees. And you have to have good settlement and strength within your lower back. And you're going to be leaning on your left more so than your right side. So you have to have some degree of balance. It's a very difficult style of sitting. There is muftarishan, mutawarrikan, there is mutarabbi'an, and there is iqa'a. These are the four styles of sitting that take place within the prayer. But iqa'a only takes place between prostrations, when you're sitting up on your, on your heels, arched. So this sitting of rest, the style of sitting that you sit is muftarishan. You're sitting on the left foot. The right foot is arched up. The toes are facing forward. You're going to come back and you're going to sit, as Sheikh al he mentions here, until every bone returns to its position. This is the manner of standing or going towards standing with Sheikh al -Abani. There are other scholars that would say, no, you would start to sit back, you would place your hands on your knees or your thighs, and then you will continue to get up. You will not use your hands as the main support for raising yourself from the floor. But most of us, we're going to pray one of two ways. If you are going down with the hands, you're going to use the hands to aid you getting up. If you're going down with your knees, you're going to aid yourself with your knees upon getting up. You're going to sit back on your heels and kind of like arc and rock backwards. And you're going to put your hands on your, on your thighs or your knees. And you're going to continue to elevate in an upward motion. That is not favored with Sheikh al -Adbani. What is favored with Sheikh al -Adbani is that the individual is going to sit back. They're going to gather themselves. They're going to relax until every bone has gone to its place of relaxation then the individual is going to stand. From that junction, supporting oneself with the hands on rising for the next raka'at. Next, he, sallallahu alayhi wa will get up for the second raka'at. Supporting himself on the ground, also he would clench his fists during prayer, supporting himself with his hands when getting up. There are two matters when utilizing the hands. There are two manners, two styles of how the individual is going to utilize the hands to raise up. Either you're going to make a fist, like a person that needs dough, or that beats dough, or you're going to have an open palm and place the hands down. The positioning of the hands in a fist to support yourself getting up is that which is supported by Sheikh al-Albani, rahimahullah ta'ala. There are others of the people of knowledge, the likeness of Sheikh Mugdil, that say that those narrations are weak. Remember, a lot of the difference of the people of knowledge is housed in the narration. Did the narration reach him or not? Did he see the narration as being abrogated or not? Did he see the narration as being authentic or not? A lot of the difference amongst the people of knowledge is centered around hadith. Did it reach him? Is it abrogated? Is it weak? What did you understand from the narration? I don't see inside of the narration 
that says, إِذَا سَجَدَ أَحَدُكُمْ فَلَا يَبْرُكُ كَمَا يَبْرُكُ الْبَعِيرُ When any one of you prostrate, do not prostrate and go down like the kneeling of a camel. That same narration is viewed differently by people in knowledge that use it for their position. So the scholars that say go down on your hands, they use that same narration that the scholars are using that are saying that means go down on the knees first. It comes down to narration, what they see inside of it. So with Sheikh Mukbil and others of the people of knowledge, they would tell you the, the format and the description of getting up to support yourself by using your fist is not supported, substantiated by narration. It's not so much the understanding of the narration, they would say the narration is weak. It's the position of Sheikh Mukbil and others. But this is the position of Sheikh Al-Albani. And he has his proof of what he sees as being authentic. Then there is the narration that mentions the hand being down. And what is understood from it is that the hand is open and exposed. The hand is open and exposed. So it is up to you to figure out what you feel comfortable with. I never impose upon anyone what I feel is the weightiest position unless it's a struggle for an individual to make a decision. And I'm only going to give you the route that I feel is best for you to know about going to this particular position, not just to say, well, I chose this, choose this. But I'm going to give you the understanding, the wudge of how I understood it's best for you to get here at your stage that this will suit you and it will comfort your heart and your mind. To understand in this situation that if you are not sure, you are not aware, if you should go, if put your hands down, hand open or fist, the basic understanding is hand open. The basic understanding is hand open. Narration is authentic, and this is the understanding that is taken from that narration. The narration of the ajin, the individual that is like beating dough with the fist to get up. This goes down to whether you see the narration to be authentic or not. So if you're in need of it, this is a situation that we would say, just drop it. If you're confused about it, you have another option. Just avoid it. You're not in need of having to follow al -Albani, anyone in uh, a particular community, any particular student, any particular family member. You're going to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you say, you know what? I'll bypass option B. I'm more comfortable with A. I have to advance to B. You're going to say, this is a good, good decision-making process that you have embarked upon. However, if you put yourself at B, just understand what comes along with it. That this isn't something necessarily that you should tell somebody that doesn't do it that they're wrong. And this isn't something without need or necessity that you should in general find yourself in a place of telling a person to do it at the same time. Why? Because this is going back to the etiquettes of the blind follower from Sheikh al-Islam ibn Uthaymiyyah. So in this situation, if by myself, I don't know if it's, if it's authentic or not, I'm just going to blind follow Sheikh al-Albani. Says the narration is authentic, it's from the Sunnah, I'm, I'm going to do it. At the same time, am I going to go around to every Tom, Dick, and Harry, every Abdullah and Allah and say, make a fist when you get up. Make a fist when you get up. Make a fist when you get up. And you say, well, what's the proof? It's oh, the next narration of Sheikh al -Labani. You say, oh, we heard from Sheikh Mokbel. Oh, well, I don't know about that. Well, how are you teaching this then? That's why I was saying in certain elements of what is presented, you will find there's going to be challenges. A student may say, I'm, I'm just... This is above my head. You don't have the knowledge of the science of hadith to verify the narration to agree with Sheikh al -Abani. It's one thing to agree with Sheikh al -Abani through the science. It's another thing to accept from Sheikh al -Abani through the science because of There are some restrictions that you have to now start keeping in mind. So after, after a certain junction, I'm beyond myself. Stay within the realm that is suitable for your condition.
حبيب اوكي طيب Allah knows best. I have not seen anything from the people of knowledge. Me personally, I have not seen anything from the people of knowledge that address this topic. We could continue to look and we could ask or offhand. What I have seen from the people of knowledge precedes this condition or this situation. Meaning what? They detail the routes and the path and the avenues that would allow a person with this condition to pray and they get, they've given him or her the guidelines that reroute him away from that. That would have this particular individual praying sitting, uh, praying in the chair, praying on the floor, making the prostration or the record from a sitting position, whatever the ailment, of the condition may be, because you're not just gonna sit for the whole prayer just because your, your knees hurt for a prostration or for a court. So we say, no, there's other junction that you can stand, that you will stand. But what I have seen, like cut this conversation off um, at the crossroads from the people of knowledge that they detail for a person that had this condition, they redirected him this way. That if the knees are too much Concerning the prostration or for the ruku' sali qa'iman fa ilam tastati' fa jalisan. As opposed to detract and going backwards, if you would say. You know what I'm saying? This is a situation where it's kind of going backwards. We are replaying the affair from the end, now looking for um, a way on how to address it from the beginning. We we'll say, no, let's address it from the beginning. In a situation like this, when you get to wherever the ailment is, pray sitting. And then continue from there. Because one of the things that Shaykh Uthaymi, Rahim Ta'ala, he mentions for the individual that is um, standing, the standing should not be a total reliance upon something. The bowing should be more towards the bowing than the standing. The prostration should be more towards prostration than it is an upright sitting. So with these type of situations, me, I would say from the beginning, let's, say, let's start from scratch and then let's build from there. Instead of looking at a, a situation where we say something has already been built here, let's see if we can find a way out of it. Let's say this is complicated. Let's take a different course. Let's exit. Let's start from scratch and let's build. Let's build a new building for you to go into with this type of situation. So me personally, I haven't seen something from the people of knowledge that address that. But what we have seen from the work of Allah Bani, from the works of Sheikh Uthaymeen, Rahim wa Ta'ala, and others, it is that for an individual that has some type of ail or ailment, incapability to perform something of the prayer, make the necessary accommodations for it at that particular junction, and keep moving forward with the rest of the prayer with ease. But like I said, we can always ask and um, seek further clarification. But the also, no doubt, the best thing to do from the beginning is to map out the course. Instead of treading the course and then looking back and say, does anybody remember the point where we started from? Are we, able, are we going to be able to get out of here? That's going to be a little uh, conflict. It's going to be a little troublesome. No. I something is necessary. Take for example, I went to a place uh, yesterday to pray for a group of brothers and they asked me what they think of the event. What they think of the event like before. And he said, why are you doing that? 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. There are, um, I don't know, la adri, Allahu a'lam. But there are two fa'idah that I can mention in conjunction with this. For one, in terms of the signs of hadith, like they have asbabun nuzul, they have reasons for why certain verses came down. They have works that tell you this verse came down because of this incident, this verse came down because of this incident. They also have asbabul wurud. Wurud. Wa ra da. Wa ra da. Wurud. Of why it is narrated. And they would tell you this narration happened because of this particular incident. The Prophet ﷺ was asked this. And this was the incident that led to it. They tell you the reasons why. That's dealing with the science of hadith. Secondly, Something that's tied into it, and this is very important when it comes to Sunnah and almost all of the affairs of the religion, is either we're going to know a reason why we do particular action or we don't. It is either it is mu'allal, it is known the cause or the reason why we do X, Y, and Z, or it is referred to as ta'abudi. We just do it out of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Understanding the ilal or the illa, the reason behind certain things, there is a benefit that allows you to extract benefit and apply it to other aspects of the deen. But then there are some things that are just unknown. But this is something that ties into it. But the initial answer of the question, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. I don't know the reason for or the cause of this particular narration, the statement from the messenger. We could go back and check from the works and so forth and see if you know we, we find anything as a result. But offhand, this is not something that I'm aware of at this particular time. So you. So, so we want to hurry and try to finish some of this real quick. We've gone past the time. It's, it's hard to. Yes, Sheikh Mokbil rejected the issue of the hands being closed upon supporting oneself to raise himself going towards the next rock arm because this is supporting oneself with the hand. Sheikh Aladdin is a favor of the fist, um, fingers closed, fist position to support oneself. It's not the position that is supported by Sheikh uh, Mukbil, Rahimah Ta'ala. He mentions that these narrations, they are da'if. They are da'if. Yeah, because the, the, the issue of the khilaf, the issue of the difference from amongst the people of knowledge is now housed in, do you see the narration to be authentic or not? So with those scholars that do, like Sheikh Al-Abani and others, those scholars that do see those narrations to be authentic, based off of the science of hadith, it, in terms of the discussion, ilmiya, knowledge based, it's not warranted, it's not suitable to just turn a blind eye to it and now say, no, that's an innovation. This is why we mentioned that when we were dealing with the statement of Sheikh al-Bani, that placing the hands upon the chest is an innovation, that this was a stern and stark statement. And we brought the statement of Sheikh Abdullah al-Bassam that mentioned that Sheikh al-Bani went a little too far with it. Because he put it in a realm that it's not discussable. With this, this is the issue that you will see that the scholars, they will say, there's difference. Meaning what? There is a, uh, a tone of this conversation that we could entertain. You would say like, Laylatul Qadr, 21st, 27th, the person said, I don't want to hear anything outside of 27. We said, no, I hear this narration. He said, no, I don't, I don't hold them to be authentic. That means that that's not your position. It doesn't mean that there's no conversation. 
So with this, there is a conversation, even though Sheikh Mukdo says that the narration is da'if, Sheikh Mukdo is not going to himself entertain the conversation to teach you that position. But in terms of if you presented it, he would say, Fihi khilaf. He would say, Walakin la nusahu al hadith, wala nuhasinuhu, wal hadith da'if indana, walakin al hadith shah. They will tell you that the narration is not, it's not sahih, it's not hasin, the hadith is da'if, the narration is shah. There are other narrations that mention that the individual that are more trustworthy than this individual that mentioned this narration, they mention the hand open. This goes into the science of hadith. We have reliable, 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 and then you may be reliable, but you're going against three now. Guess where the favor is going? With the three. But they say, well, he's reliable, but he's not as reliable as three reliable. Yes, but this is from a different wudge. This is from a different wudge. We're dealing with an authentic narration and an authentic narration. An authentic narration that affirms an authentic narration that negates. In this situation, we're dealing with something that he says it's authentic. You say it's not authentic. Regardless of what the topic is inside, the matter is inside of your narration, you're saying, I won't even consider it because I don't apply it to the sunnah. I don't see it to be from the sunnah. So you don't bring it to the table and the discussion. With the one you're mentioning now, it's like the one that's saying that narration is authentic, that narration is authentic. Your narration has three areas where the messenger, Ali Sato Salam, raised his hands. Your narration mentions one, and it doesn't mention this one. So we would say the one that knows is not like the one that doesn't know. So it's a different discussion. No, which is that? Barakul Fiqh. We're trying to hurry here, inshallah ta'ala. The second raka'at, the second raka'at. When he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, would get up for the second raka'at, he would commence with all praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning with Surah Al-Fatiha, without pausing. He would perform this raka'at exactly as he performed the first, except that he would make it shorter than the first as before. This is important now. We're in the second unit of the prayer. We've gone through the first unit. We've raised up. Now we're ready for the second unit. Sheikh al Albani says he will perform this raka'at exactly. This is very important. I want you to pay attention to this wording. Exactly as he performed the first, except that he would make it shorter than the first as before. So he's giving you a generality. Do everything in the second unit that's coming like you did in the first, except just make it shorter. Meaning what? The recitation. That's what's, that's what's intended by make it shorter, meaning the recitation. Not make the prostration shorter, not make the record shorter, not make the standing shorter, make the recitation shorter. But we, huh? What? Consistently what? Making it shorter? Yes. Yes. By narration. We're going to come back to that. But briefly, if you go back to the chapters of recitation for um, the style of recitation, Sheikh Al-Albani mentioned that the Messenger of Allah would make the first unit of recitation longer than the second unit. Of recitation. That was the common practice of the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam. So that's what we want to do. We want to fall in whatever was common for him. We want to make it common for us. Could an individual exit from that? We would say, yes, it could. You could exit from it. But then we would say, by what means? Is it by a situation of something haphazard? An individual being caught. Uh, off guard, reciting one chapter in its entirety, but just by chance, you recite it less in the first than you are now going to have to recite in the second. But to do it intentionally, that's something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. I haven't seen from this particular work from uh, Sheikh al-Labani, 
or even the statements of the people of knowledge that an individual would intend to lengthen the second unit, I mean, the, the second unit over the first. The Messenger of Allah, Ali Sadu Sam, for Dhuhr, 30 verses within the first unit, half in the second. For Asr, half of what was in Dhuhr. And then in the second unit, half of that which was in the first unit. And will continue, if you would say, to decrease. Whatever was in the first would decrease upon what will be in the second unit. So that's what Sheikh Al-Labani is mentioning here, except that he would make it shorter than the first as before. But when he mentioned he would perform this rock of art exactly as he performed the first. What's going to come to your mind? What's law here? What's just apparent? You just say, well, that's just natural when he's mentioned exactly, like tooth and nail, 100% exactly. Is that what we're going to understand? Everything 100%? Because the person said, now I taught you the first unit of the prayer. But we're doing a two-unit prayer. This, I'm teaching you Fajr. I taught you the first unit. So for the second unit, I want you to do exactly the same, except just make your recitation shorter. So that means everything is the same. That's what will come to a person's mind. But is that the case? It's not. It's not. So what's the difference? Huh? There's no taslim in the first unit. No, we're talking about make the second like the first. By here, this wording, make it exactly like the first. We say, no, 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 no. There's some exceptions. The first unit, and this is where we start to become detailed now. The first unit entailed what? The niya. You're going to renew your niya? No. The first unit entailed what? The opening takbir. You're going to open takbir again? You're not. The first unit entailed the opening supplication. You're going to do that again? You're not going to do that again. The issues where you may say, I can entertain the conversation, the isti'adha, seeking refuge. Some scholars say the recite, the the recitation is one recitation. If it's two units, three units, four units, they say the recitation is one. You sought refuge at the beginning, it covers all of the recitation. Some other scholars say no. Too much has taken place in between recitation that you now have to view the next recitation as an independent recitation. If it's independent, I got to apply what applies to it. I got to seek refuge. So this is why the scholars will differ over whether you're going to seek refuge again or not. So when Sheikh Al-Abani mentions here, seek refuge or perform that unit exactly, it's giving you an understanding with Sheikh Al-Abani, there are some things that he looks as, as obligatory. With Sheikh Al-Abani, the Basmala is part of Surah Al-Fatiha. With the Jamhur, it's not. The isti'adha, they will tell you no. They will tell you it's going to cover everything. Sheikh Uthameen, Rahimah Ta'ala, he mentions, if you did it, khair. If you did it, khair. Labet. No problem. Do it if you want to. Don't if you don't want to. Why? Because the differing is so moderate. However you see the recitation, Follow along what follows the recitation. The verse is clear. When you recite, seek refuge. That's the only reason why you did it in the first unit. Because there was a verse that said, if I'm going to recite, I seek refuge. So now I'm going to seek refuge. Now, exactly as I did in the first, I have to do in the second. Well, I saw a refuge there. Do I do that here now? Is that recitation the same recitation, meaning it's the same unit all together for recitation, not of segmented prayer? When those scholars say the recitation is one, they say the, the, uh, the etiquette that applies to it is only taking place once. You wouldn't say 
A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajim and then recite Surah Al-Fatiha. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajim qul huwa Allahu ahad. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajim qul a'udhu bi rabbil falaq. You will not do it for every chapter in the first unit. You will only do it once, it will cover your entire recitation. If you recited the whole Quran, it will, be, it will cover your entire recitation. This unit now, how do you look at it? Do you look at it from the lens of one recitation? Your isti'adi. Or the person says, no, I'm actually renewing my recitation because it's a new, a new unit. Too much has taken place. Supplication, dhikr, my own du'a in between recitation. I cannot see it as being one recitation. Then we say, then you need to seek refuge because that's the etiquette of recitation. So when Sheikh al there are some things that the fuqaha, they look at and they specify particulars and say, in general, what we mentioned from the description of how you would pray, yes, but some specifics, no. So the niyyah, do not renew your niyyah. The opening takbir, do not renew the opening takbir. The opening supplication, do not renew the opening supplication. The isti'adha and the basmala, those are two issues, they're mediocre. They can go hand in hand. Say the basmala if you feel it's part of Surah Al-Fatiha. If not, it's a mediocre situation if you want, if not. The isti'adha, how do you see the recitation? Is it one or is it separate recitations? It's upon you. So that's something that is very important that the individual has to keep in mind. When you see that statement, he will perform this rakah exactly as he performed the first. In general, 99% yes. But there are few exceptions that you want to be mindful of. Don't fall into this category. Don't fall into this discussion. The obligation of reciting Surah Al-Fatiha in every raka'at. He ordered who prayed to recite Al-Fatiha in every raka'at when he said to him after ordering him to recite in the first raka'at. He also used to say there is reciting in every raka'at. This is something that is a difference amongst the people of knowledge. Let's go back to the beginning of the prayer. Because as Sheikh Labani is mentioning here now, do in the second unit as you did in the first unit. Because from here on up, there's only going to be a few topics, maybe two more classes, possibly three, and we're done with this work. The majority of a unit is done. The second unit is like the first. The third unit is like the first and the second. The fourth is like the first, second, third, and so forth. Minor distinctions on at various junctions. Now do this. Now sit, perform the tashahud with Sheikh al-Abani, the salat and salam upon the Prophet, alayhi salatu salam, and then towards the end, reproduce everything, and now bring the taslim and the seeking of refuge. The seeking of refuge first and then the taslim. So at this particular junction, the majority of the work is behind us. There's only a few topics that still remain. Shaykh al-Admani, in mentioning that, perform this exactly as you would in the first, then going to the obligation of reciting Surah Al-Fatiha in every raka'at. We went to the first unit. We dealt with the discussion of the people of knowledge, the recitation of Surah Al-Fatiha. Was there amongst the people of knowledge? Was there consensus amongst the people of knowledge that you had to recite Surah Al-Fatiha? You say, is there consensus? Is there concise agreement amongst the people of knowledge that you have to recite Surah Al-Fatiha? You would say yes, most of you would say. You would say no. Huh? You say no. We mentioned the statements of the people of knowledge that it is an issue of khilaf. It is an issue of khilaf. The majority of the people of knowledge will tell you, yes, you have to recite it. But the likeness of those such as Abu Hanifa will say, any ayah. Any ayah. Right? Because of 
particular wordings of narration, the Messenger of Allah والسلام, said, فَقْرَأُوا مَا تَيَسَّرَ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ فَقْرَأُوا مَا تَيَسَّرَ مَعَكَ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ Beside that which is easy with you from the Qur'an. And he says, Surah Al-Fatiha. This is with Abu Hanifa. Not to say that this is the position that you want to choose or that is the most weightiest, but it means that there is difference. Once there is difference, there is no consensus. All it takes is one scholar. It doesn't take two out of four. It doesn't take three out of four. It only takes one scholar. If Abu Hanifa says a verse from the Quran will suffice, even if it's uh, a very short verse, it will suffice, there is khilaf. There is no ijma. So there is no ijma that you have to recite Surah Al-Fatiha. But we have concluded with discussion from the people of knowledge that it is obligatory. There are some of the people of knowledge with understanding that that would say the recitation of Surah Al-Fatiha is only obligatory in one unit of a multi-unit prayer. Meaning that if you're praying Maghrib, three units, some of the people in knowledge will say, yes, you have to recite it, but you only got to recite it in one of those units. Then there are some of the people in knowledge that would say, if it's a four unit, it has to be at least half. So you got to recite it in at least two. Then there are some of the people in knowledge that would say it has to be recited in the majority of the prayer. So if it's four, you have to have three. If it's three, you have to have two. Then there are some of the people in knowledge that would say, no, it has to be recited in every unit. But is there a consensus on that? No. There is. But the Surah Al Fatiha has to be recited or not. If it is recited, whether it has to be recited in every unit. So this goes back to the start to now we shape the thick of what we understand of the Salat. Does it mean that it's your chosen position? It just means that the effect of what you have of the prayer is now more expansive. He mentions the obligation of recitation of Surah Al-Fatiha in every unit. And he mentions because in one narration, in every raka'ah, in every unit. The next topic from 64, the first to shahud. This is very important. I want to give you some statements from Sheikh Muhammad ibn Adam. Tayyib, what do Even in the work of Sheikh Mokbel himself that I'm reading for complementary work with this work of Sheikh Al-Albani. In the issue that he differed with him on concerning the affair of making a fit to stand on, he said that the narration is, is weak. But in leading up to that position, he mentions that the muhaddith al-asr, the muhaddith of our time, being Sheikh Al-Albani, has chosen this position, it's too different with him. Sheikh al-Albani is considered to be the scholar of hadith of our time. So none of the other scholars of hadith, regardless of the name, regardless of the stature that they have, um, they have been risen to, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed upon them, umumin, amongst the people of knowledge, Sheikh al-Albani is considered to be the scholar of hadith of our time. Likewise, Sheikh Uthaymeen, rahimahullah ta'ala, is viewed as being the scholar of fiqh of our time. So, that's the beauty that is attributed to these particular scholars that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them. Sheikh al-Albani is considered to be the most knowledgeable person of hadith of our time. And with Sheikh Sheikh Uthaymeen, Rahim Allah Ta'ala, he's considered to be our greatest scholar of fiqh of our time. 
So I want to present something to you concerning the Tashahud itself. Muhammad ibn Adam, rahimahullah ta'ala, in his explanation of the Sahih of Imam Muslim, concerning a hadith, he mentions a point of benefit that can be drawn from it, where the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam, in the statement where they said, وَكَانَ يَقُولُ فِي كُلِّ رَكْعَتَيْنِ أَتَّحِيَةِ That the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam, would say, أَتَّحِيَةُ لِلَّهِ وَالصَّلَوَةُ وَالطَّيِّبَاتُ until the end of that particular wording of supplication, he mentions here, فِيهِ حُجَّةٌ لِأَحْمَدِ إِبْنُ حَمْبَلِ Inside of this narration, there is an argument and a strong proof for Ahmed ibn Hanbal, وَمَنْ وَافَقَهُ مِنْ فُقَهَاءِ أَصْحَابِ الْحَدِيثِ And from the scholars who are in agreement with him, from the fuqaha of hadith. The scholars of hadith, but the scholars of hadith who are sound in fiqh as well at the same time. That we would say, these are the scholars of hadith, where they are strongly endowed with fiqh. They are strongly endowed with fiqh, where they are referred to as the fuqaha of the muhaddithin. So he's mentioning that this particular narration is a proof or an argument for Ahmed ibn Hanbal and those that agree with him from the scholars of hadith that are fuqaha. And at the shahud al awwal wal akhir wajiban. That the both of them, the first tashahud and the second tashahud, are obligatory. وَقَالَ مَالِكْ وَأَبُوْ حَنِيفَ رَحِيمُهُمُ اللَّهِ وَالْأَكْثَرُونَ And the majority of the people of knowledge هُمَ السُنَّتَانِ لَيْسَ وَاجِبَتَيْنِ That they both are a sunnah and they both are not obligatory. وَقَالَ الشَّافِعِ Imam al-Shafi'i says الْأَوَّلْ سُنَّة The first tashahud is a sunnah وَالثَّانِ وَاجِبْ The second is an obligation. So what are we doing here? We're setting the tone of the conversation for Sheikh Al-Abani as he's moving forward and he's going to discuss now the tashahud. We want to understand what is the understanding of the fuqaha concerning the tashahud. What is the understanding of the scholars of fiqh concerning what is the actual ruling pertaining to the tashahud itself? Sheikh Al-Abani is going to present you one particular position and understanding. But umuman in general, because as is the advice of the people of knowledge that when you teach, give that which is the jamhur. Give that, give that which is the majority of the people of knowledge's position. And then let the people decide from there where they want to go. Whether they want to remain or whether they want to stray away from that band. And it doesn't mean that you stray away, that you've gone astray. It just means that you have removed yourself from that position to another position. Based off of proof and evidence. But initially we would just present in general, this is where the majority of them are at. You could go elsewhere, but the majority are right here. There are other positions. But what is befitting that if you are going to leave the majority and get to a position of particulars, you should be upon proof and evidence. Whether you say my proof and evidence is that I'm following the most knowledgeable person in this situation, Sheikh Utaymi says, Khair. It's a route that you could take. If you go through the work of our differences, uh, the differences amongst the scholars and our position towards it, Sheikh Qutaymin mentions that you could reside with the most knowledgeable person. So let's say now Sheikh al Albani is not with the majority, but he's the most knowledgeable person of hadith. Khair. You're in a good setting. You could do so. Let's say now the person says, I'm going with the position that is the most stringent. We say, well, why would you do that? He said, because I removed every possibility of accountability. Well, how did you do that? If I did this, I made sure I covered that. If I did this, yes, I had to do more. I made sure I covered that. If I had to do this, I did it because it made sure that I covered that. So there's nothing of conversation that comes back to me because these things are the, at the head. They're at the furthest degree of removing the liability. Once you get to that junction, you say, okay, there's nothing I, I can do. Person says, well, I feel some wetness in my pants. Should I go and we'll do over or should I just 
take it as it's just something that is from when I made a stingy or whatever the situation. The person said, I'm just doubtful. I'm just going to go. I'm going to renew my wudu and I'm going to pray off of that. There's nothing we could say to you after that in terms of your purification is because he just made purification. Nothing that we could say that there's impurity upon you because before his purification, he did what he thought was removing impurities. The person said, you did all of that? That is entailed inside of that position by Sheikh Uthameen, Rahim Ta'ala, where he mentions that the person has gone to the furthest extent. After that, there is no conversation that you or I can have with them in terms of the initial situation or incident. If it was for, if it was for purification, he's upon purification right now. If he didn't, then we would say, well, there still is a means that we would say that you don't have purification and that there's impurity upon you because he hasn't gone to that furthest extent. When the person has gone to the furthest extent and removed those possibilities, this is something that Sheikh Uthameen, Rahim Ta'ala mentioned, and he says that, yeah, we could see a person go in this course. But he said, ultimately, what seems to be the best, better than the most knowledgeable, better than that which is the most weightiest in terms of putting upon you that which removes all accountability, do that which is easiest. We have not placed upon you inside of your religion any type of hardships or difficulties. He said, this is with the ease and the essence of the religion. Allah wants for you ease. He does not want for you hardship. He said, this is the, it's not just text. This is the essence of what the deen is built upon. The essence of deen is not built upon following the most knowledgeable person. It's an avenue. The essence of the deen is not upon following the most knowledgeable person. The most knowledgeable person will not always be the person that we say, you are best suited to lead the prayer. The most knowledgeable person may not always be the person that we say, you're going to be the emir of the travel. The most knowledgeable person may not be the person that we tell the sister, this is the person we, we think we should marry. Not necessarily. So these are situations that Sheikh Uthameen, he said, with them being possibilities, we could see you marrying the most knowledgeable. We could see the most knowledgeable being the emir of the trip. We could see the most knowledgeable being the imam of the community. But in situations where there's khilaf and difference, the essence of the deen says, go with the e So the question that was asked was the hadith of the messenger والسلام, with these various wordings there will not cease to be a ta'ifatun min ummati a party from amongst my ummah clear upon the haq and they will not be um they will not be countered and they will not be deterred by those that oppose them or go against them.
They will be clearly upon the truth and the haq. From what I've seen from the statements of the people of knowledge, they mentioned that these are Ahlul Hadith. This is referring to Ahlul Hadith, the scholars of Hadith. As the people of knowledge, they mentioned the people of Hadith, they are the people who are the most pleased with the Sunnah and the intercession of the Messenger, alayhi salatu salam, because these are the individuals that are busy with the narration of the Messenger, alayhi salatu salam, day in and day out, day in and day out. Going through narration, the etiquette of mentioning the Messenger, alayhi salatu salam, sending the Salat and the Salam upon him. As he mentioned, when you hear my name, they send the Salat and the Salam upon me. They mentioned that that group, that Ta'ifa, it is Ahlul Hadith. It is the scholars of Hadith. But we're going to stop here, inshallah ta'ala, and we're going to continue um, and move forward. If we want to talk amongst ourselves, then, you know, Chai or whatever the situation is, but I've gone far. I apologize with the sister. Um, we're still trying to trim the fat, if you would say, inshallah ta'ala. هذا وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك جزاكم الله خيرا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته